Hey, welcome everybody. Uh, I'm Jordan Lewis, engineering manager here at Cockroach Labs. Uh, and I'm excited to do a webinar today about getting started contributing to CockroachDB. Uh, you probably already know it, but CockroachDB is a source available database, close to open source database. Um, you can check us out on GitHub. You can download the source code. You can edit the source code. You can send us PRs. And we really want to be a, a database that um, you know, gives you the ability as a user to check out how we work and add things that you need to be added, fix bugs that you come across, add little features that you want to be adding, or just generally, you know, pay attention to what is going on within the database. So today's going to be really like, I, I hope that it could be kind of a practical session. Um, I'm going to be sort of mostly just showing my desktop and showing you how you can get started on GitHub, you know, read the documentation that we have about contributing to Cockroach, um, as well as actually go ahead and try to do a small beginner task together. Um, so you can kind of follow along with that and hopefully get excited and get uh, inspired to do your own contributions to Cockroach. Um, and hopefully, if you do have questions during it, you can ask and I'll, I'll be paying attention to the chat room, uh, which I have open on the bottom. Uh, and yeah, so with that, I guess we can go ahead and get started. But please feel free to ask questions while I'm going because I'm just going to kind of go through this stuff and uh, if you don't have questions, I'll just be doing my thing. And yeah, so ask, ask those questions if you have them. Um, so yeah, first of all, okay, we're getting some event right page had some trouble loading. That might be why people are delayed. Okay, thanks for pointing that out. Hopefully that will get resolved uh, soon. Okay, so uh, the first thing I wanted to kind of show you is what happens when you go to our GitHub page. Um, the, you're probably familiar with GitHub. If you're not, uh, this is our URL, cockroachgb slash cockroach. Um, and the top, you can sort of see all of the files and whatnot, but it's not, too important, the main thing that I wanted to show off is kind of this big readme, um, which has some pretty good information about kind of what Cockroach is, why you might be using it, how to get started with it um, as a user, uh, links to our docs and such. Um, the thing that I wanted to kind of call attention to, though, is this kind of contributing section. Um, and this is what, this is hopefully going to be sort of your hub for trying to figure out how to go ahead and do those contributions to CockroachDB. Um, so there's a few things that I wanted to go over here. Uh, one is our contributor wiki page, um, which is kind of a link to a public part of our Confluent site. Um, and it's got quite a lot of information um, that's totally public and available for you to look at, both about kind of how CockroachDB work, works under the hood, under this understanding CockroachDB subpage here on the left. Oops, <laughs> I should turn that off probably. So I, thanks for following me on Twitch, whoever did that. <laughs> uh, let me go ahead and turn that off before it bothers anybody else, if I even can. I might not be able to. Anyway, uh, cool, cool, cool. So uh, basically, under these uh, contributing to CockroachDB pages here, uh, we have quite a lot of information about how to do the things that we're going to do today, as well as kind of checking out what what project you might, might want to even get started doing. Um, so Concord TV, it's a database, so there's a lot of things to learn about it. Um, and certainly, we're not going to go over all of that today, uh, but I wanted to sort of do a, do a sample that might be good for somebody who's really just totally getting started fresh about how to start working on a database at all. Um, and so there is another link to that on our front page. Um, and yeah, you know, just basically my, uh, what I'm trying to say here is, is check out this on your own time. It's got a ton of information, really interesting, um, but you sort of need to read it on your own, I think. Point is we have this good first issue list. So GitHub has this um, concept of a label uh, that you can assign to issues. Um, and we use this good first issue label, like many projects do on GitHub to kind of try to point out some projects that are really good for beginners. Um, and so hopefully you can, the screen share is blurry. That's not good. It's quite clear now. Okay, fantastic. Thanks for pointing that out. Okay, so what I wanted to do today is I found this kind of built-in function that we don't support that is apparently a pretty common built-in function that Postgres and other database support uh, called num nulls. Um, and so I filed an issue for it just specially for this presentation. Um, and 
what these, and so what we're going to do together is just go ahead and implement these kind of from scratch. So I think it'll be pretty exciting. Hopefully I won't run into too many problems, but if I do, that'll also be part of the fun. Um, and so what num nulls do, uh, or does rather, and num non nulls is it, it's a variadic built-in function that counts the number of arguments that uh, are null or non null. So pretty straightforward. Uh, I guess it's useful to try to figure out, uh, for example, if uh, you know, maybe you have a table with, with uh, several columns that can be null or non-null, and you want to figure out how many of those columns are null. Uh, without, without this function, I think what you'd have to do is write some kind of custom logic that says, you know, is column A not null, is column B not null, and sort of sum up those Booleans or something like that. It's kind of a pain. So the idea with this built-in uh, is that it's a little bit simpler than having to do that. Um, and so we're going to go ahead and implement that together. So the first thing that you would need to do uh, in order to start contributing with Cockroach, by the way, uh, is you'd have to clone the repo. Um, and I'm not going to do that because I already have it all set up. But in case you're not familiar, you know, you're going to go to GitHub and copy the URL and type git clone somewhere. It'll download all of the source um, and allow you to start building and contributing and stuff like that. The first thing that you'll need to do, by the way, and there are instructions in the contributing section uh, for this is that you'll also need to, there's a couple of like dependencies to install. If you're on a Mac, which I think a lot of people are, we have sort of a one-liner uh, for homebrew to install those dependencies. Um, I think that would be in the getting and building from source section. And yeah, so it's got some install prerequisites and stuff like that. Uh, basically all of these instructions that I'm going through here are also on this web page. Um, but the first thing that you'll also want to do is, is run make. Uh, so I like to run make build, which is sort of the, the command that just builds the, the binary entirely. So you would just kind of run this. Um, and that's going to do a bunch of stuff, uh, install the C dependencies for Cockroach. It'll kind of compile the web UI for Cockroach. Um, and the first time you do a checkout, uh, this is actually going to take quite a long time. Um, and which is, that's sort of why I'm not doing that uh, from scratch, because uh, it would just kind of take too long and, and waste time on the on the zoom but the first time you do that don't be alarmed if it takes like I don't know 20 30 minutes something like that because it does have to compile uh, a bunch of C++ dependencies and stuff like that um, so the next kind of subject once you've got this sort of compiling and everything and I'll, I'll kind of show you in a second what it should look like if you've compiled things successfully um, the next thing that you're going to want to look at after that would be getting your editor kind of set up to look at CockroachDB. I personally like to use uh, the Goland editor, which is the uh, IDE from JetBrains, if you're familiar with IntelliJ or uh, RubyMine or PyCharm or all of those good things. It, this is sort of the, the Go version of, of those editors. I think it's pretty good, but you know, of course, you're, it's up to you what you want to use here. Um, and right, so I, I guess uh, while this is kind of compiling, what I'll do is I'll show you, since, since I am doing one of these kind of uh, SQL built-ins as the project, um, which is a pretty easy and good way to get started, um, I'll just show you exactly what, what it looks like to implement one of these things in, inside the database. Um, uh, so what you, what, what you want to go, the, the file that you kind of want to look at for these built-ins, they all live inside of this, this uh, path, package SQL SEM built-ins. Um, there are several files in here, uh, depending on like the kind of built-in. We've sort of tried to segregate the, the different built-ins into different files. Like there's Postgres specific ones in this PG built-ins file. There's window functions in this window built-ins file um, and so on and so forth. We, I kind of want to <laughs> take some time at some point to kind of separate out this giant built-ins.go file, which is still like really, really big. It's like thousands of lines of code just because it has all these little built-in implementations. But I haven't done that. <laughs> Hopefully, I'll do that at some point because it, it, it's a bit messy. Um, so this thing is still running. I, I think, yeah. So while that's running, we could just probably go ahead and get started. Um, uh, so right, what is this about again? It's num null. So you'll, you'll kind of see um, in this the way that this file is laid out, that the way uh, to define a new built-in, we have this kind of enormous uh, Golang map called the built-ins map. And it's a pretty straightforward thing, but it maps from, the, like the key of the map is the name of the built-in function. And the value of the map is 
the way that we define these implementations, which uh, I'll show you in a second. It's kind of a struct in Go that has a bunch of information about the function, like its category. Is it a string built in or a, a comparison built in and stuff like that? Um, and it allows you to define multiple overloads as well per uh, built in. And the purpose of this is that many built in functions in SQL can take different types. For example, you could take the length of both a string value um, and you know a, a, a bit string value or something like that, or maybe a date. Maybe you can take the length of a date and that'll give you back, I don't know, the number of characters in the date or something like that. Um, I think in our case, we probably only need to define one built-in since this thing is going to work on any type um, and it's variadic, which means that you can pass as many uh, arguments into this function as, as you want. Um, so I think, let's see, I'm trying to figure out where in the file we should put this. Uh, Cause like I said, it is kind of a giant file that's not too organized right now. I guess I'll just sort of put it at the bottom of the map for now. Um, so I guess there's a bunch of internal functions here. Anyway, I'll, I'll kind of just put it here for the purposes of, of argument. Um, and yeah, I think probably in reality, we want to keep these sorted and stuff like that, but I don't think we've done that so far. So. I'm not going to think about it. So we're going to call our built-in the num nulls built-in. So we'll type num nulls here. And uh, the thing that we're going to give it as a value, um, I think there's kind of a shortcut called make built-in that we use everywhere. So um, I will put that, so make built-in. And I think what this does is it takes a couple of arguments, which is the function's properties and all of the overloads in a list. So that's what I was kind of trying to explain earlier about the, the overloads. Um, and so to make the function properties, I guess we use this struct called tree.functionProperties, which I'll copy in here. Um, and I think, let's see, so, so for the category, uh, I think that this is sort of just some strings that we use to generate better documentation. And I think this one is like, it's, I think it's kind of like a comparison operator vaguely. I don't think we have a perfect category for this one, but I'm just going to use uh, category comparison uh, just because I don't think it really fits any of the other, other categories too well. Um, and then, so for the overloads, like I said, we're just going to have one. Um, and a, an overload in the way that we define these functions is also a struct. So I'll, I'll kind of paste in this struct definition here and we can fill it out over time. I think I've, I've kind of overtaxed my computer by asking it to build uh, at the same time. Maybe I haven't built in a while. So my ID is acting a little bit slow. Um, I might actually cancel this just so I don't have to have that issue anymore. But in any case, if you're actually doing it for real, of course, you would want to let the make build kind of finish uh, from start to finish. Cool. So what goes into an overload definition uh, is the next question that we should ask. Um, and ultimately what we want is, you know, we're, we're kind of defining something that takes a bunch of input. So it needs to have its input types defined um, and it's going to return an output thing so that you have to also define the output type of the function. In our case, um, there's a little bit of weirdness because we want the input to be variadic, which means that it can take any number of types. Um, and the output is just going to be an integer, which is the number of nulls inside of the, the built-ins that you, or the, the arguments that you passed. So for that, I'm going to, I'm going to paste in this uh, typed definition. And instead of, I think what this does, tree.arg types of nothing is going to say it doesn't take any types. Um, and I think that we have like a special uh, tree.variadic type struct that you use for variadic functions. I, I just happen to know this stuff. Of course, if you're doing this from scratch, you'd sort of have to copy by example. Um, but there's so many built-ins in our, in our database already that it's, it's you know, kind of 99% likely that whatever you're adding is going to be similar to something that you've, you've seen elsewhere in the, in the same file. But so this variadic type thing, um, the way it works, I think there's a nice comment. It's a type list implementation, which accepts a fixed number of arguments at the beginning and an arbitrary number of homogeneous arguments at the end. So in our case, we don't have any fixed type arguments at the front since it's just a list of any type that we're kind of trying to count the number of nulls in it. So for fixed types, uh, we don't even need to fill anything out. Um, and then for var type, that's gonna be the quote unquote homogeneous argument at the end. In our case, it's actually not homogeneous because um, we really want it to be of any type, but we can pass in, there's something called tree dot uh, any type, I think, or I thought there was, or types dot any. Um, and this is going to let the built-in kind of accept 
a big list of of any type of uh, argument. This is var type, not arg type. The v. Okay, so we've got our type definition, and then we next need to define our return type. Um, and so, right, so since we're just going to be returning an integer, I can just put return type types.int, I think. No, I need, to, I need to actually wrap it in a fixed return type, since I guess the idea is that uh, you could theoretically change the return type of a built-in based on its input types. We're not doing that here, though. It's always going to be an integer, so you need to use this fixed return type thing. Um, cool. So next up, we actually get to define the function, which is sort of the meat of the implementation, I guess. So this is going to be the thing that the, the actual code that runs in the database when you run this uh, count or num nulls function. Um, and so the way this works in Go is that you define kind of a closure that takes a couple of specific arguments. So a eval context, which is uh, a struct that gives you a bunch of information about what's happening elsewhere in the database. We don't really need to use that in this case, as well as its arguments. Um, and the arguments are, are tree.datums, which is sort of the representation that the database uses for uh, you know, a, a column value. Um, and it gives back a tree.datum, which is the result of the function, as well as an error if we ran into any. Um, so I will, and you can see I'm kind of just copy pasting from functions nearby. And that's, that's pretty normal, I think, because the, writing these built-ins, is it's pretty rote, to be honest, except for the, the kind of meat of the function. Um, so copy and pasting, I use it liberally, and you should too. And so what are we going to do? Like, what do we actually have to do? I think it's pretty straightforward. We're just going to be looping over the arguments. So we'll say for i in range args. Um, and what we're going to check, we're going to just check whether each of the arguments is null or not. So we'll say uh, if args of i is equal to tree.dnull. Um, and tree.dnull is a special variable that means it's like the single representation of null that we have in the database. Everything that's null becomes a tree.dnull, so you can compare against it directly. Um, and I guess what we want to do here is actually we want to we actually want to be counting these things. So I'll, I'll start. I'll make a little counter up top. So we'll say var num nulls int, and then I'll just say if we do see a null, I'm going to say num nulls plus plus. So very very straightforward idea here. Um, I guess I can make it a little bit nicer too. I can say, since in Go you can ask for the value of a slice uh, with this syntax, I can. I don't even have to index into args at all. So I can say for underscore comma arg in range args, uh, I can say if arg is equal to d null, increment this num nulls counter. And then finally, all we want to do is just return this number. Um, so what I'll do is I'll say return num nulls and nil, since we don't have, we didn't come across an error. Now there's, there's one small problem, which is that uh, you can't just return sort of a, a naked integer value um, in this world, because like I was trying to explain earlier, all of the column values in CockroachDB are sort of this tree.datum interface. So in order to con convert an integer into a datum, I've got to kind of construct a integer datum. And I can do that with this tree.newdint uh, syntax here. Um, and this is, again, this is like, I don't know, it's kind of implementation details, but there's so many examples of this nearby in the same file that it, it shouldn't be too difficult for you to sort of notice these things as you're kind of trying out to build one of these built-ins yourself. Um, cool. So let's see, what else do we have to do? Um, we sort of want to define info, which is going to be the documentation string for this built-in, as well as the volatility. Um, so volatility, it may be that we don't actually have to define a volatility here, because uh, volatility is just saying whether or not um, a function given the same arguments will always return the same result. Uh, the optimizer needs to use this. Like You can imagine a built-in function like now that returns a different uh, result every single time you call it. So that's a volatile function. But um, by default, things uh, are going to be immutable. I guess we do have to define it by hand. Um, so volatili volatility immutable means that the operator cannot modify the database, the transaction state, or any other state. It cannot depend on configuration settings, and it's guaranteed to return the same results given the same arguments in any context. So that's a good example of the kind of function that we're writing right now. So we'll write down that our volatility is marked as tree.volatility immutable. And finally, we'll just want to write a little documentation string for this thing. So we'll say info uh, num nulls 
returns the number of null arguments that were that uh, the caller passed to it. <laughs> That's a little bit of an awkward phrasing. Uh, I'm sure we can do better, but I won't try right now. Um, cool. So I think, okay, so I think that's almost it. There's one more small detail that I thought of, which is that um, most of the time in SQL, if you're familiar with the way that built-in functions work in SQL, if you ever pass a null into a built-in function, it almost always returns null, since in SQL, uh, null kind of means unknown. And ordinarily, if you say, if you try to calculate some property of an unknown value, you're not really gonna know what that property is. It's, you're just gonna return it unknown in a sense. Uh, so that's why most things just return null if they get null. This one is special, right? Because you know we, we're, we're specifically asking it to calculate things based on the number of nulls that we pass it. So you have to kind of inform the system that you're expecting to get nulls. And I think there's a special function property for that. Um, and you can look in this function property struct for a bunch of you know various uh, pieces of information about what, you know, the way to teach the system how this built-in behaves. Uh, more ones than we need right now. But the one that we care about is this nullable args boolean. Um, and it's set to true when a function's definition can handle null arguments, which is exactly what we're, we're trying to do right now. So I will set nullable args to true here. And I think that is probably it for our implementation, I think. Um, so the next thing I wanted to kind of cover at this point, once you think that you might be finished with your implementation of your built-in or Maybe you're doing something a lot more complicated. I don't know. Of course, you're going to want to test the kind of the, the thing that you've built here. Um, and so I wanted to show you a couple of different ways that we commonly test things uh, in the database, specifically targeted for now at these uh, SQL built-ins. But I'll, I'll kind of show two testing methods. One of them that's uh, uh, more specific to adding new built-ins, and one of them that you can use for any situation uh, that you're testing the results of a SQL query uh, in. So uh, the one that I wanted to show you first is a, a test method that you can use just for SQL, SQL built-ins in a sense. It's sort of our scalar evaluator uh, subsystem, I, I guess I would call it. <laughs> a bit of a mouthful. So if you go into, uh, by the way, our, our directory layout, all of the source code is in this package directory. Um, everything else is kind of non-source code stuff for the most part. Um, and since we're doing SQL stuff, we're going to be looking inside of this SQL subdirectory. Um, and then within that, um, we're going to be in this SEM subdirectory, which stands for semantic. Uh, and I think that the tests that I'm looking for are in tree. Um, and tree in this case stands for abstract syntax tree. So this is kind of where all of the AST nodes live, as well as the test case that I'm looking at. Um, and they live in this test data package or directory. Um, and also inside of eval. Okay, so it's a bit of a deep tree, to be perfectly honest. So we go inside of package SQL sem tree, test data eval, and then each of these files is actually a test case in a special format that I'm going to show you. So I'm going to edit, uh, let's look at the one called built-ins. Um, since we're adding a new built-in, we can add some test cases here. This isn't a very complete file. Uh, it's just got some built-in function tests, but it's a good one for our purposes. And the way that this uh, kind of test format works is that uh, you put a directive up here um, in this case, we're always going to be using eval since we're testing the scalar evaluator. Um, and you put the expression that you're testing, you put four, four dashes, and then you put the result that you're expecting. So um, what I'm going to want to do is make some test cases specifically about this function that I've added, which call, is called numnulls. So I guess let's write some test cases. Um, we can start maybe with pass, asking for the number of nulls in just a couple of integer arguments. So we expect that this should be zero since there's no nulls in this uh, set of arguments. Maybe we could do one with one null in the middle. Um, and maybe we could do one with you know, no arguments at all. We could do one with all nulls. Um, and I guess, let's see, this one's gonna wanna have one as a result. This is gonna wanna have zero. This is gonna have two. Maybe we'll do one more with like a string or something like that, just to show that we can in fact do sort of like a variadic or a non-homogeneous set of input types to this built-in. Uh, maybe we'll put one up front, I don't know. I mean, you can go crazy writing tests, right? And hopefully you will. We expect that when you make your PR, we, we, you know, we, we will expect that there be tests and if there aren't, we'll probably ask you to write some. 
Um, so this is cool. Uh, and we can go ahead and run these tests by using the make test construct. And you, the way that make test works is that you pass in uh, the package that you're testing. In this case, it's going to be this package SQL sem tree thing. And the name of the test, which is optional. Um, but you can pass it in like this. And I think this test is called test eval. Whoops. I accidentally deleted that. Um, like so, and I think that this should hopefully just test the thing that we were looking at just now. And by the way, all this stuff is in the instructions. So if you go back to the wiki page, um, there should be instructions about uh, how to run these tests. There's this testing section here, um, maybe in building and running tests might have some, yeah. So here's the documentation about this syntax that I was just using, the make test package equals blah. Um, you can ask for specific tests. Um, so all this stuff is available on the wiki page. Cool. So we ran the tests, and it looks like we got some failures, maybe down at the bottom. And down here, ah, so I, I think I wrote a bad test case. I wrote that num nulls of null comma one null foo null was expecting to return one. And of course, this should say three, because we put three nulls in there. And I think I just probably typoed inside of the, the test case. So I'll, I'll fix that to three and try again. So any questions while, while this stuff is running, feel free to ask and hopefully I can answer. Um, cool. So that seemed to pass, which is great. Um, and I guess the other thing I wanted to show off was this sort of logic test method of testing things that you can, you can do in SQL. So this, this only really allows you to test kind of scalar functions in a sense. Uh, you can do things like adding numbers together, run built-ins, um, and anything that doesn't involve rows or tables or anything like that, that's, those all go under the category of relational uh, functions, I guess, not scalar functions. Um, and so in order to test things like if I wanted to make a table and insert stuff into it and then run functions on top of it, I have to use a different test framework called the logic tests. So I'm going to show off how to do that right now. Um, if you go into package SQL logic test, test data, let's just ls this guy. Um, you'll see another bunch of plain text files, which have a very similar format to the one that I was just looking at. Um, and so why don't we go ahead and edit one in there called, we can just look at this built-in function one, maybe, which I guess it's a generic name, uh, but it probably has a good deal of tests in here. Um, so we can go to the bottom. And I guess the test that I wanted to show off since we were just running uh, counting nulls on static arguments, um, I sort of wanted to uh, try to see what would happen if um, we made a table with some nulls in it and ran this function over the columns in that table. So we can try that out. The way that this function works, this, this test framework works is very similar. There's a directive. So if I say statement OK, it's going to run the following SQL um, just on its own and not expect any output at all. So I can say create table, uh, I'll just call it um, nulls test or something like that. And maybe I'll give it an integer column um, and a string column. Let's also insert some data into it. And we can do different combinations of nulls and not nulls. So I'll say insert into nulls test values. I'll do, first we'll do a non-null case. So like this. Um, and let's do some other inserts. We'll do values one foo. We'll do values one null. We'll do values null foo. And then we'll do values null null. And this is the purpose of this is just we'll be able to test all of the combinations, I guess, of, of our function. And then finally, what we'll do is instead of just doing a statement, we can actually do an assertion. So we can say, if we say query i, what this means is that uh, we're going to run a query and expect a single column back, which is an integer column. That's what i stands for. Um, and I'm going to say select num nulls of a comma b from nulls test. And hopefully, and you're right, so it's the same syntax. You put these four dashes. That means you're about to expect, you're about to write down the expected results. And I'm going to expect to see zero for the first row, um, one for the second, one for the third, and two for the fourth. Um, I suppose we might see some issues here because of ordering. So actually, let me quickly add another column uh, at the front um, called ord, just so we can order it. And we'll always get the same. 
you know, I don't actually need to do that. I just remembered. So there's this directive that you can add to the query directive uh, called, uh, it's like sort results or something like that. Uh, row sort, I think. And so what row sort does is it uh, makes sure that the output is sorted um, in both the expected and the actual results so that you don't have to make sure that your output is always going in the same order. It's kind of convenient for tests. Um, cool, so if in order to do that, uh, right, in order to run these is what I meant to say, um, you can quit this and run make test base logic files equals built-in function. And what this is gonna do is run these logic tests, which again, kind of just spin up a SQL server and, and run all of the statements you did and assert the results. And you can pass in a particular file uh, to this file's um, argument here, and it's gonna run just the statements in this file. So I'll run that, and hopefully we'll pass the tests. <laughs> and then we can talk about how to actually make a PR and send it up to Cockroach. These tests take a bit longer to run than the eval tests because they have to compile the entire database. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think that's, that's kind of why I like to write the eval tests first if I can, because well, they're just a lot quicker to iterate over or iterate on, I suppose. One thing that I kind of like and don't like at the same time about the Go programming language is that it, it likes to be really silent when it's doing stuff. So if you run Go test, it's kind of expected that you'll see literally nothing in your console while it's doing its work, compiling the tests and everything. Um, I think it's a little frustrating because ideally, I guess I would see a progress bar here instead of just having to wonder what the heck is going on. But if you're seeing this for yourself, you know, it's, it's kind of expected. I don't find myself missing Java too much, but one thing that I do miss about Java is that their test framework does have a bunch more output during moments like this. <laughs> Someone's asking, if, is yesterday's video available on YouTube? I don't actually know what yesterday's video was, nor whether it's available on YouTube. <laughs> but I can, I can definitely ask and find out for you. Maybe one of the other hosts knows. All right, so this is finally running. And what it does when you run it like this is it's actually going to print out all of the SQL that it's running, as well as you know, sort of the result, whether it passed or failed. Um, and it runs each file several times in several different configurations to make sure that we're testing the database thoroughly. Um, but the point is that uh, I suppose that we did pass the tests. I think if we had failed the test, why don't we do that to just make sure that we can see what would happen if we failed. Let's, let's add three to the results, even though we expect two. If I run this again, um, hopefully I'll see something red. And it, it should be a bit quicker to run if I don't actually edit any of the source code, but we'll see. Okay, so you saw there is a failure here, which is sort of good, it means that we're actually testing some stuff. Um, it says that, you know, built in function line 2761, we expected to see 0113, but we found 0112. Um, so, I guess that does confirm that we're in fact testing something, which is exciting. So I'll kill this uh, and uh, undo what I just did. And then we can go ahead and make a PR together. So let's go ahead and first look at our git diff um, to see what we've changed. It looks like we've added some tests for the built-in function in our logic test suite. Um, this is our actual function implementation here in package SQL sem built ins.go. Um, and then here is our tests inside of the eval package. Um, and so that looks pretty good. There's nothing in there that I don't expect in my diff. 
Um, so I'll go ahead and create a new branch for my PR. I'll call it num nulls. Um, and I'll go ahead and make a commit. So I'll say, first I'll add the fi files that I am trying to commit. So I'll say git add one, two, three. I'll say git commit. And so in our, when, when you type git commit in Cockroach, there's kind of a nice set of recommendations in here for how to create a commit message, uh, which I find really useful because we do have some good conventions that we want you to follow. And by the way, those conventions are also documented on our wiki, um, contributors, contributors wiki under the uh, what is a good Cockroach DB PR section here. Um, and a lot of this is going to be sort of repeating what I've been trying to talk about. You know, we want to have unit tests. There's some style stuff. I guess I didn't really mention that, but we do have some linters and whatnot that you can use and code formatters so that your PR is going to look how the way that we expect. Um, and then it kind of talks about what we want out of a git commit message. Um, I guess that we actually have a separate page on that, <laughs> um, but you can, you can kind of read this as well after the, after the webinar. But what's kind of nice is that inside of git commit, it's going to give you all of this information just in a, in a really easy to digest form. So what it wants you to do is put, um, as the first part of your, of your commit message title, the package that you change. And in this case, I changed the built-ins package. So I'll say built-ins colon. Um, and then I want to do a short description. So I'll say add num nulls built-in function. Um, and then it's kind of asking me to fill in these points. So what was there before, why it needed to change, and what I did about it. Um, in this case, there was nothing here before. So I'm just going to say uh, added the num nulls built-in function, which counts the number of arguments that are passed to it, which are null. And then the final thing that you need to do is fill out a release note. Um, and this is to help our excellent documentation team uh, make sense out of the mess of commits that go into the repository every single day. And we really need you to fill these out. Um, and in fact, the linters will fail if you don't fill them out. So, and the way that you can figure out how to write a release note is it's also inside of this uh, file here that pops up when you do git commit. If you scroll down, um, you'll see Release note must be present if your commit has user facing changes, things to keep in mind, a bunch of guidelines, some examples, and it gives you a bunch of categories. And the categories are what I was looking for uh, because when you write a release note, you want to put inside of these parentheses kind of the category of change that you're, you're making. And in this case, I'm making a SQL change. So I'm going to use the SQL change category. So I'll say release note in parentheses SQL change. Um, and then for the, for the note, I mean, in this case, it's really like basically the same information that I'm doing here, but I'll just repeat it. Um, so I'll say release note SQL change, uh, implement the num nulls built-in function, which, you know, to be honest, I think I'll, I'll just not put anything in the description here and, and make it a single release note, release note, which is a valid thing if it's a simple commit. So I'll just copy and paste this, um, put it down here and make the whole thing a release note like so. Cool. So that's that. I will make, quit my editor, make the commit. And I will go ahead and make a branch on my fork. So the way that we prefer uh, um, contributions is the sort of GitHub fork PR model. So you'll kind of make a fork of Cockroach on your, on your user. You'll make a branch for it. So to do that, you can say git push dash u, uh, and then the name of your fork remote, which I call mine. Uh, this is all standard stuff if you're familiar with GitHub. Um, and you can go ahead and open up the PR link that it gives you, um, which is going to some unknown browser on my system. There it goes. So I'll open this up. And there I have a nice new PR. Um, and so the last thing that I wanted to demonstrate is just that in order to link up a PR with an issue, you probably found an issue that you were working on that was marked as good first issue, which is this one in my case. Um, what you're going to want to do is go to that issue and figure out its issue number. So in this case, it's 51507. And you're going to want to kind of link the two together so that people know when you get when they get the PR that this is the related issue to the PR that you're sending. So you're going to want to say something like closes um, and then the number of the issue. 
I think in this particular case, the issue actually um, asks for another thing, which is the num non nulls built in, um, which I guess I didn't implement, but you can imagine what it does. It's just the opposite of the num nulls built in. Uh, and so for cases like this, if you are kind of sending a PR that only partially closes an issue, you can change it to say, you know, touches or something like that, or refers or something like that. Um, so I'll just say touches 51507. Um, and then I think, I think that since I, I am a um, contributor already, I can specify reviewers. But I think as a first time contributor, you won't be able to specify reviewers. So I'll kind of just make a PR like this to see what would happen. Um, and I think also, yeah, there's one more thing, which is that as an external contributor, you will get a message from this bot that we have called um, Blathers, which is going to, you know, comment and say something like, hello, welcome, you know, thanks for sending your first PR, uh, tagging some reviewers since you didn't tag them yourself. Um, and somebody will hopefully take a look within a couple of days. Um, and yeah, so that's kind of that. Um, I think that's basically all I wanted to say. I guess there's one more thing, which is that you should, if you're going to contribute to Cockroach, you should definitely, definitely make sure to join our CockroachDB community Slack, uh, which is a great place to get help for Cockroach uh, contributions. Um, and you can get to that by going to, I'm trying to remember like, where do we have a link to this on this, uh, on this wiki page? I'm not actually not too sure. Um, maybe up on the front page. We should definitely make sure to add that. <laughs> I'll make sure that that happens after this. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. That's also some internal stuff. Okay, so yeah, I think, but there's a, there is a link though. You can go to uh, cockrow.ch slash slack. Um, so I'll, I'll paste this into the uh, chat and you can join it right now if you're not already in it. Sid says, is there a need to sign a contributor agreement? Yeah, that's a good point. Thanks for reminding me about that. Um, I think there is this licensed CLA bot that will pop up if it's your first time contributing. And it will just be a link. I don't know. This stuff is pretty standard. It's You've probably seen it on several other um, open source PRs. There's nothing weird in here. It is some legalese, but there's nothing, there's nothing weird. It's just kind of uh, saying that you accept your PR into the same license that we use in, in Cockroach. Um, but that'll get automatically, you know, sort of assigned to you when you make your PR for the first time. Um, and yeah, I think that's about it. So uh, I think if you have any questions, please put them in the chat. Um, and otherwise, we can call it in a few minutes. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, it was a pleasure telling you about how to contribute. I hope this was helpful for you. Um, and I hope to see you also on GitHub pretty soon. I expect you will all be sending your first PRs momentarily. Um, and by the way, if you did enjoy, just on a, on a quick uh, note, if you did enjoy watching me do live programming for you for a second, I do do a weekly uh, Twitch session on mostly about contributing to CockroachDB. Um, and kind of other Golang related projects. Um, and you can check me out um, on Twitter or on, uh, on Twitch. My Twitch website is Large Data Bank. So I'll put a link to that as well. So if you do, if you do enjoy this, please give me a follow and uh, I hope to see you on, on Friday as well. But anyway, I think I'll call it for now, but thank you again so much for uh, stopping by. Have a great rest of your day. And goodbye. <laughs>